thank you for uh, for having me here. Um, yeah, I am the next talk. So this is kind of the overview of what we're going to do. Uh, so the idea is that I am going to present Graphoscopy, a tool that I have been doing uh, with, uh, with FAR, with Smalltalk, uh, for working with civic tech and grassroots innovation. Um, and uh, I'm going to present the question that motivated my, my PhD research and how I did it. Um, the hypothesis was a, a thesis on design and creation in the arts and humanities faculty. Uh, and the, let's say two approaches for Graphoscopy. Graphoscopy is a community and a tool. And, um, and I will present you also some possible synergies and, and uh, futures. And finally, I, I am going to, to hear your questions and comments. So first, thanks for, for having me here, for being here. And I would like to, to give special talks to the communities and institutions that allow me to be here. Uh, the Hagbo Hacker Space in Colombia, uh, the Graphoscopy communities, the Zetas Libertaria communities, and the Copincha communities. I will, I will tell you more about these communities as I go into the presentation. Uh, wait a little bit. Um. And uh, also, thoughts to the institutions, uh, the Javeriano University, where I work, especially the Information Library and Archival Sciences, and SUC, uh, because, yeah, uh, SUC organized this meeting, has the student volunteer program that allowed me to be here in, in, well, in Prague in 2016, and also the micro grants uh, uh, that are a big difference, at least in the Global South. So they, they gave me a, a micro grant, and yeah, it makes a lot of difference over there. So this will be an accented talk in, in several senses. Of course, I have an accent. Uh, so excuse me for some typos and mispronunciation. It will be an opinionated talk, uh, informed by local experiences and context. And um, yeah, I, I say that uh, in Spanish, I am talky and funny. And in English, I am silent and mysterious. So thank you for dealing with this mysterious version of myself. Um, and uh, yeah, I am not a coder or a software engineer or a computer scientist. My background is in uh, informatics and mathematics, that is more theoretical. My master's is in education, and my PhD is in design and creation. So it's in an arts and humanities faculty, so I'm not a coder. Uh, and by the way, this software is called Free Plane because most of the people after the, the, the talk uh, asked me about the software. So yeah, with that out of the, of the, yeah, uh, of the topic, I can like, focus on my presentation. So, uh, this is going to be a, an unusual small talk uh, history and also oh, uh, talk maybe. Because you can contrast uh, the disciplines, places, and people that is usually related with the small talk. Um, so usually the disciplines are related with computer sciences, software engineering, and similar disciplines. The people is computer scientists and engineers, and the places are usually mainly universities, research uh, centers, and software enterprises. And usually they are located in the global north, like United States and Europe. Uh, and there is this, um, let's say, diaspora to the south, in Chile, in Bolivia, and in several countries of Africa. But they are like, like uh, have this vector of academia. Um, but uh, in our case, uh, my, my research is, is uh, happening in a design and creation PhD, as I told you, in an arts and humanities faculty. Mm. And now it is happening in an information library and archival sciences in a communication and languages faculty. So it's not the usual places where small talk is deployed. Um, and the people that is related with my research are artists, journalists, philosophers, designers, activists, musicians. So it's not the, the, yeah, the usual small talk user. Um, and, um, and the places are mainly a hacker space in Bogota, not a research institution. And I am working with data storytelling and uh, code and data literacy, what is called critical code and data literacy. So we don't start with the Hello World example. For me, it's kind of strange and dumb. So we don't, we don't, start, we don't start with the syntax. We start with, with uh, problems, like problems in context. And, and the place is mainly Colombia. So uh, this is an independent resonance story, hopefully. And you will see the, re the, the resonances later. So the question that motivated my research was related with how we can change the digital artifacts that change us. That was the, the question. And, um, and yeah, it's, it's about the reciprocal modification of communities and digital technologies. 
So I have been a long uh, free libre thought for open source advocate and researcher. Um, so in Spanish, we don't have this problem of, of the duality of free. Uh, we don't have free as in freedom or free as in, uh, in beer because free is libre, that's it. So it's about rights uh, and it's not about gratis. It's not about like, yeah, the market. Uh, and I see free libre open source software as a kind of solidarity because, because that means access to using your computer without being a, a, a charged by pir of piracy, being able to deploy business and technology is used in the schools. We created something that is called the FLISOL, the uh, Festival de Instalación de Software Libre. So it has been happening in uh, like 20 hundred uh, cities in 20 countries since almost 20 years. So maybe it's the biggest installation festival in the world, but it happens in the South. So it's not very well known in, uh, yeah, in the rest of the world. But we created that like 20 years ago. Um, and, um, and we can use uh, free libre open source software as a digital commons that is used glo globally, but is made mainly in the global north. So it's mostly an Anglo-European creation, despite of being used as, as well. Um, but I start to have this critical approach to, to free software, this idea of the four freedoms. So the freedom of users, distribution, study, and, and distribution of, of modified copies. That, that is important, the idea that you can have access to, to the source code as a prerequisite. Uh, but the issue is that you cannot change what you cannot understand. Uh, and that, that means that malleability is a differential value on understanding. If I want to understand something, I need to be, a, a, I need to be able to, to mold and to change that. And that means a certain kind of discourse embedded in the artifact, a way of, of changing the artifact by interacting with the artifact. So it's not about like having the source code because we know the amount of indirection that is uh, there with having the source code. There is a lot of indirection. We need to still to compile or to interpret or to make sense of the software. So it's not, it's not about that. Um, so my hypothesis was related with, uh, we introduce a self-referential digital artifact in grassroots communities mm. and to explore the consequences. Um, so I create what I call like a writing feedback bootstrap. The idea was to have an artifact that was made for writing and I can write about the artifact. So it's an artifact made for writing and I can write about the artifact. So I have like this virtuous cycle, but I can write about other things like for example, garage and citizen science or, or academic activities or, or transmedia workshops. Um, so the more I write about the stuff, I can feed back into the artifact and I can feed back into the different topics uh, that that artifact was empowering. So this is related with, this was kind of a draw for my thesis. Uh, so this, this is related with a property that was the way that I found a small talk. So, uh, it's called, uh, I was like asking myself about what I was calling technocultural autopoiesis, the idea that, that uh, so there is this theory about autopoietic systems that came from two Chilean biologists. They are called uh, Maturana and Varela. Um, and the idea is that you can have a system that describes the system. So the ability of a system to evolve uh, is related with this kind of cell description. The, the idea that a system has a discourse about itself and about the, uh, uh, its surroundings. And in this interaction, it can like recreate itself, like keep the frontier between the external uh, system and the internal one and start to evolve. Uh, so I was thinking, okay, can we have something like that in informatics? And for me, this idea of meta system was related with uh, something like a small talk. But I start with, with, yeah, with autopoiesis and biology theories. Uh, and um, and uh, like trying to find these theories also in other places, like in sociology or in uh, yeah, biology, sociology, design, and I start to think, okay, what is the equivalent of this kind of stuff in informatics? And for me, it was like this uh, meta system, the system that has this description of themselves. Um, uh, my idea was, okay, what if I can like, like join these uh, competing mantras? Everything is an object, that is the one we want, and everything is a file from the Unix war, that is the one who won. Like the, the future of, of computing was molded by this idea of everything is a file. So my idea was to create a, a software that deals with writing files, uh, but those files were objects and were interactive objects. 
Uh, yeah, so this is more theoretical stuff about like the autopoietic systems, and the idea was to bridge those systems, the, the biological, mental, and social system with the artifacts. And in that, in that, uh, in that question, I was like, like creating this particular artifact that is Graphoscopio. So Graphoscopio at the beginning was uh, like a documentary that has notes, and those notes can be code or markup. That's it. And by traversing the tree, you can do stuff with this traversal. So you can like, because this was my first program ever done in Faro. Or, well, in any language for, for real. So was my, I, I want to keep like stuff like pretty simple. So uh, the idea is that you can write a structure and unify uh, several things. You can compute and visualize. You can collaborate and publish. And you can explore and modify. Uh, and that was done with this interactive documentation by a storytelling. Uh, and, and I use it for several things like data activism and reproducible uh, research and publishing. Um, as I told you, this was my first FARO program ever. I, I didn't start with a Hello World. Yeah. I don't like that example. It, yeah, I, I know that uh, brings a lot of passion, but yeah, I think this is kind of a dumb example. So uh, that was my, my, my start path with uh, Madre Encontro with Smalltalk uh, in 2014. And, uh, and the Graphoscopio community is the one where I introduced this artifact, the idea that you can write the interactive text and you can traverse this text in a particular way. Um, so it's composed uh, by diverse people with different backgrounds. For example, we have librarians, new programmers like myself some years ago, philosophers, journalists, philo philology and students, communication st uh, st uh, people from communication studies, activists, artists. So they are not pr programmers. And we have done also 800 uh, hours of workshops since 2015. They have like two formats. The, the first one is called the Data Week. It's some kind of long week anti-hackathon. And it's an anti-hackathon because these days everything is a hackathon. Have you seen? Like, like everybody needs to be like sleep the private to have some kind of idea of business at 3 in the morning with people that they don't know to win an Atari at the end of the session, something like it's super strange. Uh, because those not where the, the old hackathons, no? When we come from the hacker community, it's about like, like a bridge between the past and the future of a community. And this playful encounter is not about a business idea in the weekend, kind of a, this exploitative consulting. So yeah, it's kind of a, this anti-hackathon. And uh, we have a smaller version that we call Data Rodas. It's kind of a joke on coding dojos. So yeah, because coding dojos is this abstract form on coding with abstract problems. Uh, but data rodas are like related with, you, you know the roda from Capoeira? It's kind of more dancing and embedded into the world and trying to be like more playful. And it's about data because data is uh, a critical thing about the world, how we interpret and use data. So we try to make this joke about like coding dojos by making these data rodas. And it's a small one, one afternoon version. And we have 70, six editions since 2015. Um, and we have uh, created several uh, prototypes, um, exploring um, several domains. So I think that metaphors matter. If we use a particular metaphor, we, uh, let's say, bring a lot of uh, context and thinking with this metaphor. So the cloud, for example. This idea that the cloud is this fluffy, ubiquitous place. And, and most of the people say something like, I don't know, you just fire up a browser and point to a direction. Um, because you have the cloud. And it's just super cool. Where is the cloud? Because if you are fighting a browser in the global south, maybe you don't have connectivity. So, uh, and maybe you are putting your data in this, this idea that the cloud is other people competing, uh, competing resources. So they are like tapping into your data and looking for patterns in the way you write email to your loved ones, stuff like that. So I think that metaphors matter. Uh, so instead of the cloud, we try to use what we call pocket infrastructures. So pocket infrastructures are infrastructures that are simple, self-contained, extensible, and local first. They can run literally in your pocket. We have done this with no uh, good connectivity by using just uh, USB drives, for example. So it's not, it's not this idea that because, you know, these metaphors of technology all are super shiny and super uh, exclusive in a way. No, like big data. So who has the power to process big? Who has the power to storage big? Artificial intelligence, no? Like, like okay, artificial, but has a lot of people behind. Yeah, I, yeah, we can go with this idea of 
people in Kenya who is paid two uh, two dollars the hour for cleaning uh, data for ChatGPT, for example, and from the stuff that is like pretty heavy. So it's a lot of people behind these artificial things. So the idea is that not having these uh, like let's say opaque metaphors, but metaphors that are critical that showcase what is happening behind computing, and. Uh, um, so we start to do this, this uh, we, we use these pocket infrastructures in several uh, fields. One of them was self-publishing and documentation. So the first thing that I did was to create the Graphoscopio manual inside Graphoscopio. So this is Graphoscopio, as I told you, is a tree. This tree has pieces of code and data. This data, for example, is a dictionary, and this dictionary controls the way that the Graphoscopio uh, manual is exported. So by putting this data inside, you can create this PDF, and this PDF is the, the is this version of Graphoscopio exported with the dictionaries that are defined inside the small talk. So the, the notebook has a description of itself inside itself that allows me to control the way that the, the, yeah, the software is exported. Um, yeah, we have several repositories. Uh, and we also create this uh, republishing of the data journalist handbook that was published in 2018. Um, and, and with that, we want to explore, uh, make a critical exploration of what we call nominal freedoms versus the factual freedoms. Because the issue is that when you see something that is published under Creative Commons, it's published as a PDF under Creative Commons. So yeah, that's nice. You can do like, uh, you have the nominal freedom to do changes, but you don't have the actual freedom because you don't have the source code. And of course, as programmers and coders, uh, we give that as granted, like, okay, if you are going to give me this freedom, it's because I have the source code. But most of the people, for example, in journalists has this uh, opaque, let's say, PDF, in the sense that they don't have the source repository behind. So once the PDF is created, it's kind of enclosed in a way. So we start to create this kind of uh, reverse engineering of, of those uh, PDF. So they have also a, a HTML version that is not the version that they use to create the, the manual. But anyway, it's good enough to scrap that version and to recreate that as a, as a Graphoscopio notebook. So we start to do that. We, we went to the HTML page, we scrapped the, 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 the sources, and we recreate them as Martip, and we recreate them as a, as a Graphoscopio document. So we were able to, again, to reproduce this publication. But this publication was reproduced as a reproducible PDF. So again, we use the dictionary inside a uh, Graphoscopio node to control exportation process so we can control templates and all that stuff. And we can have this, this new version that is reproducible and, and also you can start to include more stories inside. Not only from the journalists, but from the people who is making data storytelling in other places. Like for example, in the hacker space, in the local hacker space. They are using data to tell stories, but they are not journalists. And they can be part of this publication because the publication not only have the, the, let's say, nominal rights is under Creative Commons, but has also the actual rights. The, you, you can use the source code and, to, and modify the source code to create a new version that contains more stories of more people creating data stories. Um, so this was one of, of our republishings. And this one was in the same fashion. I, I'm going to focus mostly on this kind of republishing, but I will show you some other um, some other prototypes that we create. So this was the Data Feminist book. Uh, it's, it's done by Catherine Dignash and Larry Klein. They, they talk about using intersectional feminists to deconstruct other power relationships in technology. So this idea that you have binary relationships and a naturalization of power can be used, this critical thinking about that can be used now about other, uh, let's say, binary relationships with embedded power inside. User developer, data user, data consumer, executable versus source code. If we start to, to create this kind of bridge between these two postures, we can rethink relationships of power embedded in these kind of strong divisions. And, um, and we want to create this meta comment on publishing infrastructures about data feminists. So they use the MIT, this is called Pop Pop uh, Press. It's a, it's a place where you can publish your books and you can like create your books also, I have reviews and stuff like that. But the issue is that it's super complex. I'm not going to show you the source code, maybe if I have time, into the end, I, I can show you. But the issue is that it's like this classical place with a lot of JavaScript, like super complex behind uh, the source code is pretty opaque, despite of being like like uh, HTML. Like when you see, uh, I don't know, the HTML produced by Wix and this like uh, uh, 
custom creators for web, web pages. So we create the, let's say, a more or pocket version. Maybe I can show you like the, the source code like pretty fast. I will try. So let me just do a little bit. Um, yeah, I'm going to show you like super fast what is the idea. So yeah, so this is the, the source code of the of the publishing platform inside the, the one that, that is used by MIT Press. And this is the one that we recreate with our pocket infrastructures. So if you see the source code behind this, is this classical one line page. Oh, let me show you. So yeah, this is this is this web page, the source code. So is this pretty opaque, uh, automatic like automatically create uh, uh, HTML page that is pretty pretty opaque. And the issue is that when you have like these over complex infrastructures, you are putting an artificial barrier in the person that can participate. So one of the core principles of the Graphoscopia community is to simplify infrastructure to diversify and amplify participation. So if this is the stuff that you need to start to see behind, you are already excluding a lot of people. So this is this is the, the source code of the web page in the MIT Press publishing, and this is all republishing, and this is the source code. So it's something that is not going to be seen at the beginning, but if you want to go deeper, you need to see what is happening behind. So we try to simplify this, uh, and this is just Mardip, a uh, supra set of Markdown that is uh, like pretty plain, and you, you use a JavaScript library to put this behind. Uh, so we create this, this other, uh, let's say, alternative publishing, uh, and we create a workflow that mixes several tools, like Hashdoc, Pandoc, uh, Fossil. We, we don't use a lot of JIT and GitHub, because again, is this already over complex infrastructure and not all of us are kernel developers. We don't need to bring all the complexity of the kernel development into every workflow, collaborative workflow of, of publishing. So we use Fossil, that is the one behind SQLite. Uh, so it's a pretty robust system for, for version control, but don't have like all the implicit complexities of kernel development. Um, so yeah, we mix all these uh, tools, Hashdog, Fossil, Pandoc, Faro and Graphoscopy for documentation and Marley for creating this web view. Uh, and yeah, it's again like, like creating this meta infrastructure. So, so by, by publishing again in a simpler infrastructure, we are enabling, enabling other people to participate and other workflows. Uh, and we create our own book. This, this, as you see, this is mostly republishing, taking something that is already in the web and, and, and publishing again in simpler infrastructures. We will create our own booklet that is called Documentathon, Agile and Resilient Tools and Techniques uh, to write and publish together. So in our workshops, we're already, we're all the time writing and we're all the time publishing in real time by using these tools. So we create this, uh, this tool that talks about how we use these workflows, how we mix Hashdog with Pandoc with uh, Graphoscopio to create like, like this kind of publishing uh, workflows. Um, yeah. And uh, there we, we mix like uh, all these light formats with, uh, with, uh, yeah, with interactive tools that are provided by, by Faro and by, by Graphoscopio. Um, so yeah, and, um, and we were part of some mapping that was made by Copin. Copin is a project in the United Kingdom that is related with uh, community-led open infrastructures for, for for, monogra for monographies, to publish monographies. And we start to see that there is a lot of resonances between what Copin is mapping, like this idea that we can have like this, like this uh, community-owned infrastructure for publishing, uh, and the stuff that is happening in several places, like for example, the critic of academic publishing. Because as I, 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 we were talking with Alexander yesterday, the most important thing for a community is not read about a, uh, read a paper about themselves. Like if, if we are going to make community-led uh, research, like with grassroots communities, the grassroots community doesn't want to read a paper about themselves. That, that works for academia, but not for communities. So there is this idea of, of having another uh, publishing uh, places where, and also a, a more diverse um, publishing artifacts. So yeah, for us, a paper is kind of good, kind of, it depends, 
but, but for communities, it's more about wikis, tutorials, like this critical material that is circulating every day and that is documenting their day-to-day -day practices. Um, and, um, and we start to republish several works from several academics around the world. Uh, these are some examples. This is an example. The Living Book is a publishing uh, critique on publishing artifacts. Uh, it's by Janet K. Adema. Uh, she published with MIT, but she's into this kind of alternative publishing. She says, she says well, it's, a, it's a long critique, but it's a critique that is related with, with how the book can be, uh, let's say, place of resistance in a way against the publishing paper, publish of Parish, and all this, uh, let's say, uh, circuit of academia that is pretty focusing a single thing instead of, of valuing diversity in several ways, in, including publishing. Uh, so we're recreating this publishing, and this republishing is a way to talk with authors in other places. Because now we have like these artifacts that circulate in other places and contexts with other infrastructures, and, and to allow a meta comment on infrastructure, and, and also allowing uh, some kind of interaction between learners of these kind of other ways of publishing and grassroots communities, for example. Um, yeah, and maybe we're going to do something like that with some Faro books, because because Faro books have uh, like this nominal and factual freedom, no? You have like the, a proper license and also the source code. And maybe we can use some parts of the Faro books uh, to, to empower other contexts, like for example, teaching object-oriented program, programming or at least some concepts to librarians. That is the place where I am like, like now working. Uh, we made something related with reproducible research. I'm going to show you like, like, pretty, like pretty quickly. So the idea is to bridge uh, code, data, prose, and visualization beyond the PDF uh, to look for all the resources behind a paper. Mm. We did that with a couple of examples. One was related with health, um, health data. This is a custom visualization made in Faro and Rosal 2 related with how we publish uh, open data about the, the components of medicines, like the active uh, principles behind medicine or components. And this was done by a, by a postgrad student uh, in, uh, a, um, I don't remember, epidemiology. Um, and, um, and yeah, this is used usually, in, so this was a way to convey complex information about like re uh, release public information on medicine in 16 countries and was empowered by, by Faro. The idea was that um, this reproductive publishing is used in, in science but it could be used in, interna in investigative journalists. For example, this is an example, this one over here, about how we can use that for Panama Papers. This was part of my, of my yeah, I make an internship in Chile, and this is the reproducible version of the Panama Papers, a little bit, because the Panama Papers at that time was the biggest leak in, in uh, journalist history, it was like 13 terabytes of information, but the proper data, the curated data, was like 30 megabytes, something like really, really small. So we can put that in a SQL uh, uh, database, uh, a small SQLite database, and we can interact with Faro to create this reproducible research that is interactive in the sense that created this map that is uh, interactive uh, and has a data story behind that, that creates a database. But everything is self-contained in a small toy image plus a SQLite database. So it's this kind of bundle that has everything that you need to, to reproduce your research or journalist uh, claims and to extend that with other people. So it's not about like being, the idea is to, to create this kind of symmetry between the tools that uh, journalists are using to publish the research and the, the tools that are used to, to do those claims. So the issue is that most of the time when you go to, I don't know, the uh, Guardian uh, webpage, it's, it's super cool, has the, all this JavaScript and everything, but you cannot download, you can only download the data, you cannot download the environment where they like find those claims. In this case, no. You have everything in a place that you can download and you can play with that. So the publishing place and also the infrastructure behind. Um, yeah, and we did something similar in Civic Tech. We created something that we call the Twitter Data Selfies. So the idea was to have uh, something that allows you to, to, I need to check on time. Can, can someone tell me when I have like five minutes? Okay, someone, okay. So, the idea was to, to create this, this data selfies, so data selfies, that you can like make sense of the stuff that you're publishing online by taking your data and, and making graphics of, of those data. That was one of our 
prototypes. The other one was related with air quality in a citizen network. So this is a project of, of a friend. He's living now in Berlin, but he's a Colombian in Bogota. And the idea was to create sensors of quality of data. That wa they were open hardware. Uh, so workshops were to create their own sensors so we can well, like track the quality of data in, uh, in several places. I don't, I, know, I don't know if you know, but we have our own scale of data that was just switched a little bit. So uh, what was like, I don't know, red alert in other places, in all the rest of the world, was yellow alert in Bogota. Like this idea, just change the color, uh, but was the same measure. But if you change the color, you have this public perception, oh, no, 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 it's just orange, it's not red. So yeah, and, and the, the government in, in Bogota, the, I mean the, the major government, has their own running sensors uh, that was, they were private, and they were like, I don't know, switched off in particular moments. Uh, but uh, by making these sensors widely available to all other people and the data widely available, they need to put the proper scale back, not the switched on uh, like the index of Bogota. So that was part of, of, of the work of my friend. And what we're doing now is to, yeah, he's my friend, he's Antonio. And what we're doing now is to, to explore, for example, the API of this uh, and creating these reproducible artifacts with, with Graphoscopy. So it's about like, okay, they have the hardware, they have the workshops, they have the, the citizen network, and we want to make sense of that by using Graphoscopy to telling the stories. Uh, this, by the way, is the last version of, of uh, yeah, we're, we're making some migration from, let's say, Plain Faro and Rosal 2 to Lepiter and Rosal 3. We are in this kind of exploration. So this is kind of the new version. And this is also a uh, like super plain uh, publishing, uh, uh, yeah, publishing format. I will show you more after. But the idea is that we can explore these, um, these APIs and create stories about how we can create these uh, reproducible uh, places and claims for citizen empowerment. Um, and this is one of the last projects that we did. So we make some consultancy for inter, an intergovernmental entity. And uh, yeah, uh, we create some open source software. Uh, this is called Candidates in Data. So what we want to create is uh, Candidatos and Datos, Candidates in Data, was a portrait of what the candidates to the presidential election wa were telling in uh, Twitter. Uh, so when we, we were asking how much, when, about what, and with who are the Colombian presidential candidates talking in Twitter. So we create, this is the last visualization. We create, this is in fact the winning couple. So we create a data scrapper uh, that is done with Faro and Nim mostly. Um, and we create this data visualization. This data visualization was done, was done with Rosal2 and we do some exportation of PNGs and put that with mustache in satellite template and create this, let's say, static view of, I don't know, uh, 1,500 tweets. And we create this, this view of what is happening in social media uh, and what is the public discourse of candidates. So in this, we, we can see like, the classical tag cloud, a histogram. We can see if a candidate is replying or not and with what, which frequency. And over here is the profiles that they are amplifying in a way because they are answering to them or they are quoting to them. So it's, it's kind of gives you a graph that allows you to make sense of the discourse and the people that each candidate is amplifying or replying to. And it's an exercise on critical uh, that data literacy. So it's not that you are going to see this view and have a perfect glimpse of what is happening, but if you know how to interpret the data and you do this numeracy, literacy, and graphicacy uh, um, learning, you can make sense of what is happening in social media. We did that. We did this for all the candidaturas. Can, can, yeah, all the candidates. Um, so the idea is that we want to tell these data stories. This one is about like yeah malleable systems, and this was about like this is a current story that we are working on that is about mapping global innovation. So I am part of a network of hacker spaces and maker spaces around the world, and, and we have a database of what we're doing and we want to create these small artifacts that are reproducible and that can be used offline to, to map global innovation. And in Graphoscopy at the beginning, we have, this is the format of Graphoscopy. So yeah, if you can see, it's, it's mostly, it's a stone. So it's uh, stone with 
Markdown Inside. That was from 2015 to 2019. That was the, the moment where I was working with, with yeah, Prim Faro and, and Rosal. Uh, but now we are using Mardip. Mardip is this supraset of Markdown. Uh, and we are creating these, these data stories that are now Mardip with snippets of, of Stone Inside. So I will show you like super quickly over here. Um, so this is our last data story. Let me show you. So this is written in Lepiter. Uh, it's just a data story, but it's published um, in Mardip. So this format this is a format that you can see in the web. The extension is .md.html. That means Mardip. Uh, and when you see the source code behind, it's just these uh, small divs with stone uh, metadata uh, that is uh, intertwined with Mardip. That is just the superset of Mardip. So you can publish this. You can see the source code. It's human div friendly. You can see the transformation. You can send that to another people that has not Lepiter or Smalltalk or anything like that. You just send a web link and you, they can like see the, the documentation. But they can rehydratate, let's say, this document inside a full interactive image. Uh, so if you compare this with, for example, uh, yeah, if you compare this, this change that is now embedding a stone inside Mardip with, for example, Jupyter Notebook, we have a lot of advantages. So Mardip is pretty light. It's uh, uh, 305 kilobytes of JavaScript. Uh, support importing and exporting. When you go to a Jupyter page, I mean, a publish a Jupyter page, you cannot import that back. It's just uh, HTML, plain HTML. And if you, want, if you try to see the source code in the Jupyter, in the IPython notebook, it's a lot of JavaScript that is not human readable, deeply nested. Um, so. In this case, we have like this, like this, uh, like like format that supports exporting and importing. It's human and computer diff and diff friendly, and is visible in the web browser with any web, any web browser that has JavaScript enabled without com com complicated bureaucracies. I don't know if you know, but in GitHub, if you want to support a new format, they are going to ask you, okay, how many users do you have for your format, or mode, or Jupyter, or whatever it's like. In this case, it's just uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's just plain JavaScript in a web page. Um, so yeah, the idea is that we're creating this, let's say, call, let's call data haikus. So it's not about big data, this exclusive narrative of bigness and artificialness and stuff like that. It's more like if you want to find the needle in the haystack, you need to build a magnet instead of the threshing machine. So most of the computer now is about like building the threshing machine all the time, like this big, Let's put everything up over there. As you can see, I am like pretty passionate about not doing that. Uh, instead of okay, let's create the magnet. Let's create something that that attracts the properties of the stuff that we want to see. So we are creating all the time this magnet. Uh, and what we're looking is for for numeracy, not for big big fancy data or AI, what I call apparent intelligence. Uh, it's, it's more about like making sense of of numbers, of visuals and context and it started with the problem. We don't start with let's print hello world. We start with the context and the problem and going from there to critical literacy and tools. That's what we're doing. Uh, so for the, first, for the last part of my presentation, I would like to show you, um, I would like to show you um, how, what's, how this is hypothesis went. So my idea was to connect two meta systems, systems that are able to describe themselves. Uh, and I think that it has, it has proven to be an empowering experience because I have communities. Communities are a meta system. A community has a discourse about themselves with Faro, Graphoscopy, or Glamorous Toolkit that is a, a sort for meta system, a system that has a contained a, a discourse about itself. So you can modify the system inside the system, and communities are like that. So this, this kind of interaction is empowering. Um, but we are just bootstrapping a conversation. So we are bootstrapping in the sense that we are we're trying to, to replace a complex system with a future version of itself. So we have these complex systems that are communities plus technologies. And the idea is to replace communities plus technologies with a future version of communities plus technologies. But the idea is to make explicit the meta system properties behind 
this possible replacement. Uh, but this, this is a conversation. And a conversation has like two parts, a provocation and active listening. So it's not that I have like this like super theoretical, clever idea in my PhD uh, that I want to convey to other people. I want to seduce them, but I want to listen to them also. Most of these uh, prototypes are part of this active listening. So uh, yeah, the idea of self-publishing was part of what I was trying to do. But, but the workflows, the tools, uh, the use of Tiddly Wiki for other stuff I will show you is part of this uh, active listening. What they need. It's not about like the pureness of the idea. No, it's about like this dual conversation. Um, uh, but longer interactions and more intensive curriculums are needed. Uh, this is, early prototypes are promising, as you can see, and we have this intensive curriculum, 18 hours of data activism. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's kind of working but we need a longer process of education in this alternative stuff. Uh, and in the possible synergies and futures for the last three minutes, is like we are working what we, I call like personal, interpersonal, and community knowledge management system. We have something that is called Tiddly Wiki Faro. It's they use on another meta system, Tiddly Wiki, this self-contained wiki in a web page with JavaScript with Faro. So we can like create in Faro computational views of, of these uh, Tiddly Wikis. And we are using that in several stuff I am not going to show you would uh, map in uh, like plastic vesicle uh, in, in Havana, in Cuba, where you don't have Google Maps, for example, it's important. Uh, we are working with a group that is making uh, like growing mushrooms in the coffee region. So creating these data stories also for the way they manage knowledge in the coffee region. And we also like, yeah, grow stuff over there and eat the stuff over there. We are going to use uh, something with uh, some indigenous people in the Amazonas, in the Colombian Amazonas. They are called the people of the center. So the idea is that we're going to use this uh, knowledge management tool to do linguistic revitalization, community memory, and what is called community informatics. Um, and we need to, to rethink metrics of research. So we have uh, metrics that align more the, the publishing artifacts of academics and communities. It's not about index of papers or how much we talk about each other in particular circuits. So that's the idea. And we want to also to do some landscaping of data commons stations. Uh, because, yeah, you can have your favorite megalomaniac taking care of your network or take, took in your network, and you need to see how to revitalize conversation in social media. So we want to do something like that. And we are open to other ideas. That's it. So thanks again. Um, we have some tensions to explore. I'm not going to go deeper into that. But yeah, in the Global South, we have this problem of funding and bureaucracy. Uh, but the issue is that, um, that infrastructures are a way of accumulate and organize, uh, an organized action to embed and transport context and to inform imagination. So the infrastructure that we are exploring now that is, uh, is enabling us to explore and inhabit alternative futures. We in this room are kind of an explorers of a world where kind of a small talk won in a sense. So we have this pretty interactive uh, environment and we are exploring that by using this infrastructure in, day, in our day-to-day -day practices. So I want to extend that with other people that is exploring alternative ways to inhabit the world. So thank you again for, for being part of this community and for being so welcoming and for exploring with me this alternative future. Thank you. <laughs> or do we have questions? Yes, uh, thank you. I had a question about fossil. I know what it is, but I wondered about the discoverability of your work if you're not using GitHub. Yeah. yeah, it's true. I, I think that when you choose a particular infrastructure, you choose a set of values, let's say, that infrastructure is, is embedding. So for example, if you choose, uh, uh, I don't know, Faro or Smalltalk, you are saying, okay, for me, it's more valuable to have like quick feedback instead of popularity, because you are not using VS Code and uh, TypeScript. So kind of we are going, we are assuming this kind of, of uh, choosings. So in our cases, okay, I, I want to work with people that has no uh, previous experience in computing. So it's kind of a good environment because they don't have like, oh no, but this is not like TypeScript or this is not Visual Code or this is not JIT or GitHub. So they are not thinking into that. And I'm trying to simplify the stuff the most I can for them. And we are also having this critical approach to what is called uh, uh, GAFAM, Google, Apple, 
Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft. This idea of big, big oligopolies that are centralizing all data and interaction, even for what was at the beginning uh, distributed infrastructure like JIT. So what we are doing is that we have fossil for our, uh, let's say, data narratives, and Gitea, Git, like this uh, GitHub in a box that is powered by Go for the repositories. Uh, and we create some extensions that allow you to index. Once you, are you, once you install our, uh, our tool, it's called, uh, uh, I don't remember, ExoRepo. You can use ExoRepo to index all the work, but you need to find ExoRepo first. So ExoRepo is also in Git, uh, in GitHub. And uh, once you start it, you can like index or, or uh, work in other places. We need to find uh, extra repo free. So yeah, we are dealing with this uh, non-discoverability, uh, but it's a conscious choice. Um, yeah, and, and I think that for me, that's why it's important to be here because discoverability is about more interacting with communities that, that being visible in, uh, I don't know, having a lot of stars in GitHub or something like that. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I love this work you're doing. Uh, it, it seems like it's more publishing than interactive. So, so this is this is a web page. This one? No, this is just uh, um, a, a mind map made in uh, in free plane. Uh, so yeah, it has like two parts. Uh, one part is publishing, uh, and the other part is data stories. So for example, the Canario Network, the network of air quality, uh, uh, it, they have their own place and their own budget and their own yeah, stuff. But we are doing is uh, this, uh, let's say, interactive exploration of the API to create this reproducible map that is like self-contained in TiddlyWiki, for example. So it has these two parts. Uh, today I was focusing on publishing mostly, uh, but we have this data stories part. Uh, yeah, so they have these two fronts. And yeah, this is not our page. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I am asking your question because, yeah, I don't know if I understand like, your question properly. Okay, but, but yeah, I would like to, to know more if I have time, but I don't know. Or maybe you can launch and that's it. Okay, cool. Yeah, let's talk later. Okay, thank you.